Uh, what you'll hear for today, however, is uh, a couple of lectures on Roman cities. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yes. Good. Uh, there are, of course, lots of cities in the Roman Empire. It was one of the characteristic features of the Roman Empire was that it was more urbanized than any of the preceding societies anywhere around the Mediterranean or the Middle East. And it was more urbanized than any of the societies around the Mediterranean right through until probably the late 18th, early 19th century. Uh, ancient Rome, for example, when these numbers that I frequently quote to uh, this, this class, is thought to have had a population at its peak in Roman times of about one million people. Uh, whereas the next time we got back to having a city of that size anywhere around the Mediterranean was London in about 1822 or something of that sort. So there's a, this huge gap of 1,500, 1,600 years between this immense city of the, the capital of the Roman Empire before you get something of the same size again. But of course it's not just Rome itself. Uh, within the Roman Empire there are, well we don't know precisely how many, and of course the definition of a city varies, or sometimes it would have looked to us to be not much more than a rather miserable little village you know, with a few public buildings in it. Uh, but some cities were very large, Antioch, Carthage, Car uh, Alexandria in Egypt, Ephesus, Roman London, Roman York, these were all fairly substantial places. And at a guess there were probably somewhere between two and two and a half thousand places that were qualified as cities in the Roman Empire. So it's a, uh, it's a considerable number. Uh, the greatest concentration being in the Italian peninsula itself, but then the other place where you get a lot of cities appearing is along the frontiers, uh, where the Roman army was settled. And the army, uh, simply because it consisted of large numbers of soldiers who were receiving a regular pay, three, four times a year being paid in silver, and this is in an economy empire-wide that was still essentially a barter economy, or one, a subsistence economy, in which people grew most of of what they needed for their own purposes or they swapped it with their neighbors. You know, very little monetary transactions taking place. So to have a large group of people, soldiers, in a particular location who are being paid regularly in silver year after year, decade after decade, for several centuries, that drew in all sorts of people who wanted to sell them things, sell them goods, sell them services. These soldiers, particularly ex-soldiers, were regarded as uh, you know, reasonably well-off people uh, at the end of the 25 years service, if they'd survived, uh, they were given not just a pension when they were uh, discharged, but 25 years of compulsory saving that had been on, done on their behalf by the army was handed over. And they were given all sorts of legal perks as well. So the, the places where, in particular the legions, but also even the smaller regiments of provincial soldiers were established around the frontiers, these became, in many cases, quite significant settlements in their own right, and sometimes uh, grew into quite major cities. One of those is this place, Conuntum, that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, as you can see from the subtitle, it's the, the capital of the province of Pannonia Superior, and it was a legionary headquarters. Uh, questions to start with, since uh, I appreciate that Conuntum is probably not a name that you know, you're likely to be all that familiar with. Uh, you know, where is it? What do we find there? What's the significance of the place? Why am I talking about this one rather than any one of the other two and a half thousand? what was its role in history, and then say something about the excavations and the place as a heritage site. I think that may be the air, the air con man. Uh, map of the Roman Empire to help to locate it. As you can see, this is a, a map of the Roman Empire in the time of the Emperor Claudius. You know, so Britain has just begun to appear as a Roman province. It's in the time of the Emperor Claudius that the invasion took place. Uh, part of the south and east had already been annexed and established as the new province of Britannia. And Claudius was responsible for those other green areas that you see on the map there, Noricum. Noricum up here, roughly Switzerland, western Austria. Uh, Thrace, that's modern Bulgaria, and uh, a bit of uh, Turkey and Europe, and Mauritania down here. So Claudius was responsible for adding quite considerable new territories to the empire. But the one we're interested in now is Pannonia there, uh, just to the east of Noricum. It's on the river Danube, uh, and it's roughly modern eastern part of Austria and the western part of Hungary uh, is, uh, modern, is, is ancient Pannonia. It was a major military province throughout its history, and that's something that's going to feature quite significantly in the, uh, the lecture. Just to try and locate it as you'd see it today if you were to look at uh, Google Earth, 
uh, you know, what is there is, and the reason that I'm looking at it, is that there are major Roman ruins to be seen at the site. You know, so if you ever find yourself in this part of Austria, uh, it's just to the east of Vienna. It's an easy trip out by, by train along the Danube to the site, uh, easy to find, and it's well worth the visit. There it is there at the far end. That in straight line is about 40 kilometers, you know, so a bit further by the train, but it's a, an easy trip. As you can see, it's, it's on the River Danube in the middle there. That's the, the dark line, dark greenish-blue line running in this great curve through the middle of this uh, satellite image. But you can see another reason that it's an important location is that apart from the valley itself, which of course is prone to flooding still today, you may remember there were terrible floods there a few years ago. Uh, in ancient times, it was probably even more uh, untamed. But the land, the higher ground, once you got away from the floodplain, is today, you can see from the fields on either side, it's an intensely uh, settled area for agriculture. Uh, a lot of good farming land there that would have been an attraction in itself. Uh, strategic and economic location, uh, well, there's the, the River Danube, as we just saw there. It's very broad, it's a swift river, uh, so that in one respect it's a natural barrier. You know, so it would have been seen as a, a, a natural frontier for the Roman Empire to have this great river in front of where they established their garrisons. On the other hand, it is a navigable river as well, so it uh, functions as a route. It's an easy way of transporting materials, goods, food up and down the, uh, down the river relatively swiftly. Transport by water was much, much cheaper in the ancient world and right through to modern times uh, than any sort of transport by land. So if you have access to a navigable river, that was a great uh, resource uh, to have on your, in this case, on your doorstep. Uh, it's also on the amber route. I'll go back to that previous map. The, the amber route brings you down from the north, crossing the Danube. It brings you from the Baltic, you know, where amber is found, but amber being traded, and along, a lot of other things that were traded along with amber uh, coming down into the Roman Empire. So you've got this east-west route of the river itself, then you've got a north-south route of, uh, for the amber route coming down from central Europe and uh, the Baltic, Baltic far to the north. Uh, and then there's the Fertile Valley that I mentioned. Now that's worth bearing in mind, not just because it was attractive to, to settlers, that there would probably have been farmers there already. That's important for the Roman army. The Roman army also has to be fed. There's no point putting soldiers down in somewhere that looks like a splendid location on top of a hill somewhere if there isn't water and easy access to food supplies. So most Roman military bases, particularly the large legionary bases where you've got 5,000 soldiers, they tend to be placed somewhere where they can be fed relatively easily, either from the hinterland of the fortress itself uh, or if, uh, in this case, you've got a river as well to help transport food up and down to feed the soldiers. So no surprise that a Roman army camp was established in this part of the river frontier at a very early time in the Roman Empire. First of all, there's a, a relatively modest base for a, a, one of these provincial regiments, uh, these auxiliary regiments recruited from the provinces as opposed to the legions that were recruited from Roman citizens and were much more prestigious. They were the, the elite. So it starts off as a fairly modest army camp. Then it's transformed into a legionary fortress. This is at Canuntum itself. Uh, and then it became the provincial capital of the provinces, Pannonia Superior. Now, in theory, Roman provinces didn't have capitals, not partly because the, the governors were expected to be moving around all the time. You know, they were also the, the supreme judges, so they were expected to move around assize centers, uh, and you would not often find them in the principal city of the province. But it's still convenient to talk about the capital of a province because that is where the governor would probably have nevertheless spent most of his time. And in this case, it's not just a where the governor is spending most of his time, but it's where there's a large legionary force nearby and all that that implies. Uh, and it's a base for regional campaigns. Uh, it was uh, a good place during the, the, the summer campaigning season to cross the Danube from and then undertake these campaigns into Germania on, on the far side of the river. And it becomes a, a major base for a number of imperial campaigns. Now, just to sketch in the, the history before we, we turn to looking more at, uh, uh, at the the archaeology of the area. And at the time of the Emperor Augustus, you know, he's emperor from 30 BC through to AD 14, there are wars of conquest that Augustus launches right the way taking the Roman frontier up to the river's Rhine and up to the river Danube uh, to try and sort of round things off to, to end up with the great river barriers uh, in the north uh, of the, this part of the Roman Empire. But also they went beyond, you know, that having reached the Rhine and Danube, 
and annex those areas behind them as a series of provinces, you know, Germania Inferior, Superior, Pannonia, Noricum, and so on. Uh, they then conduct campaigns beyond the river as well in the late 1st and early 2nd century AD. So this whole area along the Danube, the, the upper Danube, is uh, one that's throbbing with military activity in the time of the Emperor Augustus. A uh, whole series of military bases established along the river. Uh, the future Emperor Tiberius, operating as the, the field commander for his uh, stepfather Augustus, uh, is said to have founded Hiberna, a winter camp, uh, at Carnuntum in AD 6. Now we know that from the very first mention we get of Carnuntum as a place name uh, from the historian Valerius Paterculus, writing in AD 40, but referring back to the campaigns of uh, uh, Tiberius, you know, he, he refers for the first time to Carnuntum as a military base. So the emperor, future Emperor Tiberius is evidently based there at one stage, conducting campaigns beyond the River Danube. Uh, fast forward 130 years and Carnuntum is mentioned in Roman history as a place where a Roman army was conclusively defeated by these two great tribes from just beyond that part of the Danube, the Quadi and the Marcomanni. Uh, a few years later, and as a result of that uh, defeat and the humiliation, uh, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius went to the frontier himself and established himself at Carnuntum from 172 through to 175. And it was while there that he's said to have written part of his famous meditations, you know, a work that you can still get in Penman translation to this day. So the seat of an imperial campaign in the early 170s, and of course it meant something to actually have the emperor there. It's not you know, simply a, you know, something to note in history. Having the emperor based there for three years meant that that effectively was the capital of the Roman Empire for those three years. The emperor goes there with his whole entourage, large part of the civil service, large numbers of senators would go with him, large numbers of the, the uh, equestrian order, huge additional military forces would be brought in, the whole place would have been throbbing with activity. Everybody who wanted to have any sort of communication with the emperor during those three years, they didn't send their people to Rome to speak to him or to give him petitions or to ask for things, they had to go to Conundum. So suddenly for three years, all routes converged not on Rome but uh, on Conundum. So it matters that there's a, uh, the place is being used as a, uh, an imperial, for an imperial campaign base. Uh, the next point of contact is just 20 odd years later with the Emperor Lucius Septimius Severus, who was, well, in 193, he was governor of the province of Pannonia Superior. And as I've mentioned before, I remember giving a lecture two or three years on Septimius Severus. Uh, the Emperor Commodus was assassinated. He's the, the Marcus Aurelius' son, he's the last of the uh, Antonine emperors. He's assassinated sometime during the night of the 31st of December, 1st of January, so we're not sure whether he you know, was 192 or 193, but whatever. When people woke up in Rome on the morning of 1st of January, 193, Commodus had been assassinated. There was a new emperor called Pertinax, a member of the Senate. News would have been sent out rapidly from Rome to all the important people around the empire here to tell them what had happened. There was a new emperor. Uh, who for some months was likely to be uh, rather uneasy on the throne, to put it mildly, and indeed he was assassinated three months later. One of the people who would have received this news that uh, Commodus was, was dead and that Pertinax was emperor would have been the man who governed this major military province. It's the biggest garrison close to Rome. You know, if you think of Britain has uh, a, a large garrison, but that's quite a long way off. The next big garrison is Syria, way off to the east. So the biggest garrison <coughs> in proximity to Rome is this one in Pannonia. So Septimius Severus, its governor, uh, would have been one of the first people to get the news of what had happened. That's important because when Pertinax is assassinated and a, a replacement for him is put up, at that point, Septimius Severus has himself proclaimed emperor by his soldiers. He marches on Rome and after a, a vicious civil war, he emerges as uh, the, the, the new sole emperor uh, and establishes the Severan dynasty. So Conuntum is important in 193 when all this is happening, you know, when the news would arrive, Severus would have to stop and think about what do I do, do I you know, send a, a message of loyalty to the new emperor, uh, I, he's no better than I am, I could be emperor as well, and he seizes his opportunity of, uh, just a few weeks later and has himself proclaimed emperor. A serious thing to do, if you get it wrong, you, know, you don't get sent off into disgrace somewhere, uh, you, know, you and your family are likely to all be put to death. You know, so it wasn't a decision you made lightly. You had to be really pretty seriously ambitious or confident or both. 
Uh, fast forward another 100 years uh, to the time of the, the, the when we got four emperors, uh, the so-called tetrarchs, three of them met at Conuntum, including Diocletian, the most senior of the, the four tetrarchs, in AD 308. Uh, and it's while they're there that they come up with this formula uh, to grant freedom of religious belief. You know, that's one of the sort of foundations of uh, what Constantine is to do uh, a generation later in making Christianity uh, free to practice. Uh, the Emperor Constantius II was there probably in about 354, 361. He's the, one of the sons of the Emperor Constantine the Great. 374, that whole area, including Conuntum, was overrun by German invaders, you know, tremendous uh, destruction all along that part of the Danube, including this legendary base and the, the associated city. It was partly restored after this uh, German invasion in 374, uh, but it, it never quite recovered, and if the effective new major city in the region moved westwards to the place called Vindobona, uh, where there was another legendary base, that's modern Vienna. You know, so today, the fact that the, the major center of Roman Pannonia moved to Vindobona in the fourth century is the reason that we've got a major city at Vienna today and you've just got a village and some ruins at Conuntum, uh, which had been the capital. Uh, Severan dynasty, uh, who are Severus that you see there, who was proclaimed emperor in 193 and goes on to establish the Severan dynasty. There he is in this wonderful wooden tondo, it's a wooden board that's uh, been painted. Uh, there he is with his, his empress, Julia Domna. They're interesting people. Severus himself is from Libya. Uh, he may have a little bit of Italian blood running in his veins because there had been settlement there, but he's almost certainly part Berber and part uh, Semitic because his family were part of the, uh, the settlers who'd come from uh, what's now the Lebanon uh, and established a colony there several centuries before. Uh, his empress is certainly Semitic. She's from Syria, uh, from what is uh, today modern Homs, ancient Emesa. So we've got a, you know, a Semitic, a, an almost entirely Semitic dynasty, and there's the two sons. You can see both of them, can't you? This is the one who eventually emerges as the sole emperor. This is Caracalla, an extremely vicious man, put it mildly. And the reason that his brother isn't visible there is that he had his brother put to death at an early stage. Uh, while the brother was hanging on to the mother saying, you protect me, uh, he had his soldiers come in and kill him in his mother's arms, her being spattered with, her blood, with his blood. Um, not a particularly nice family. Now uh, there, just to uh, fill you in on where all these legions were along the frontier, as you can see, with Britain up in the top there, we've got three legions in Britain. This is in the time of Severus when many of these provinces have been divided, so it's showing Britain is divided into two and likewise the other provinces. Uh, but for the, when Severus becomes emperor, uh, this division hadn't yet taken place. But we've got a whole string of legions along the Rhine there, starting on the Danube, a whole string more very close together, and then down the Danube, looping down here. This is Dacia, which is beyond the Danube and then the legionary forces in the eastern provinces. Now, when... Oh dear. Oh, there we are. Uh, the three major military provinces of the Roman Empire in 193, when Commodus is assassinated, are Britain, but as you can see, it's a long way from Rome to Britain. You know, news would, just even getting the news there would take a long time. Pannonia uh, is up there relatively close. Uh, a few days of hard riding, you would, a messenger would be able to get there with the news. And then the third major military province is Syria, well off to the, the east. So Severus is in a, uh, an ideal position there at his uh, capital legionary base of Conuntum. So no great surprise that he's the man who's able to send messengers to the governors of the neighboring provinces in the Balkans, all these ones down here, and say to them, throw in your lot with me and I'll see you're okay further down the line. Uh, and he's able then to put together a large force and march on Rome and have himself proclaimed emperor there. And then he sets off and defeats the governor of Britain and then turns east. Uh, sorry, he, he goes east first of all, defeats the governor of Syria and then comes back and defeats the governor of Britain. And at that point here, he's the, the, the sole emperor. So a lot of very exciting things happening there in the, the 190s with uh, the Civil War. And a close-up of that part of the, the frontier uh, with 
these splendid symbols of, of legions. Uh, Conuntum is here, 14 Gemina, the legion 14 Gemina at Conuntum at that time. 10 Gemina is at Vindabona, that's modern Vienna. Uh, Brigetio, uh, another legion, and then further along, modern Budapest had the, the legion to Dutrich. So there's four legions on that bit of the, the frontier, all very close together, which helps to explain why Severus is successful, that he's, he's able to draw on a, a large military force nearby. Not just the four legions, each of about 5,000 men, but all of the provincial regiments, you know, the auxiliary regiments there that would be even more numerous. You know, so at a stroke, he probably had access to 50, 60, 70,000 soldiers, which uh, gives him the edge against his opponents when the, the civil war starts. Uh, the Roman army at Conuntum, we know a lot about it because large numbers of uh, Latin inscriptions, and they are almost entirely Latin, uh, have survived at the site. They've been well published. There's, uh, you know, if you simply Google Conuntum inscriptions, you'll find there's a website in which uh, some tireless Austrians have you know, gathered up all the information and put up wonderful photographs and texts of, of these inscriptions. I'll put up just a few just to illustrate you know, what this sort of evidence is like, because if you rely solely on the literary evidence, you know, what the historians have to say, you don't learn much about Conuntum. But we've got this other source of inscriptions from the place about people who actually lived, and in many cases died there, uh, that give you an insight into what was going on and who the people were. This is one of the most famous ones, because this man begins as a cavalryman in a regiment uh, of provincial soldiers. So that on his tombstone, we even see his male shirt there, his helmet, his greaves, you know, to protect his, uh, his uh, shins. And there is somebody holding the traces for his horse. Uh, the inscription itself tells us that he's Titus Calidius, uh, son of Publius of the tribe Camilla. Uh, so his full name is Titus Calidius Severus. He's the son of a man called Publius, and he belongs to the voting, voting tribe uh, Camilla. By this stage, the voting tribes were irrelevant. You actually had to be in Rome itself to vote but still Roman citizens were all assigned to a particular voting tribe. He then goes on to say that he's an equis, that means he's a cavalryman, and then he was a, a, a junior NCO, he was an optio, and then he was a decurion, that's the equivalent of a, um, a centurion in a provincial regiment, and the provincial regiment in this case is the Cohors Prima Alpinorum, uh, so a regiment that had been raised originally somewhere in the same region of the Alps. Then he was promoted he, to becoming a centurion of the Legion 15 Apollinaris, uh, at the time of his death, he was aged 58, it says, and he'd served 35 years when he died. Now, a Roman soldier, legionary soldier, would be discharged after 25, 26 years. But if you were a centurion, there was every incentive to stay on. You were well paid, well beyond the, you know, several times the rate that a, a ranker got, so that it was well worth being able to stay on in service. So if you do the, do the arithmetic, he joined up in the army when he was about 24 years old, and he finally dies in harness 34 years later when he's 58, and then ends up by saying he lies here. Quintus Calidius, his brother, put this up. It's possible his brother was also a soldier. So a man who starts off in a provincial regiment, probably as a non-citizen, gets citizenship, almost certainly, since he ends up in a legion and as a centurion, and stays on and makes something of a name for himself. But here he is, uh, dead and buried at uh, Conuntum. Another... One uh, to Gaius Valerius, uh, who I won't go through the whole thing in this case. Gaius Valerius, he's a soldier of the same legion, the 15 Apollinaris, died after 16 years service, aged 36. So he'd enlisted when he was about 20. You have to take a lot of these numbers with a pinch of salt. When, once you joined the army, the army kept track of how long you'd been there. And you, know, you would actually put your years of service not in terms of I've been a soldier for 10 years, you would say, I've, been, I've received 10 annual salaries during, uh, since I joined the army. So you're, you're, in this case, he says that he's had uh, 16 stipendia. He's received 16 annual lumps of salary. So they would know how long they'd been in service, but they would probably have been very vague if anybody had pinned them down as to actually how old they'd been when they joined up. Uh, they'd often simply make a guess at it, you know. And it's surprising how many soldiers claim to have been 20, 25, 15, 30, something divisible by five uh, when they joined up. That, that usually gives the game away. Uh, another sign of the Roman army at Conuntum is that they're great builders, of course. They have their own legionary uh, kilns for making bricks and tiles, and they would stamp quite a lot of these with the insignia of whatever regiment or legion it was that was involved. 
This is a particularly attractive one for the Legion 14 Gemina, uh, which replaces the, 15, the, the 15th Legion there. Uh, in the first century AD, the 15th Legion, which had been there for some years, and both those men we saw in the earlier inscription uh, had been soldiers in it, was moved far to the east to Satala on uh, the Euphrates frontier, right in the, the northeast of Turkey. And a legion that had been in Britain up to that point, and is well attested on the, the frontier with Wales, is now moved to Central Europe and established as a legionary garrison at Canuntum. So we get a, a lot of further evidence of the building activity of the legion here from this magnificent stamp there. There's a splendid visitor center at the site today. Uh, if you ever find yourself in that part of the, the, the world, if you're visiting Vienna, it's well worth making the trip out to, to Canuntum. And uh, the, the visitor center is very attractively set up, uh, including with all these replicas of what Roman military standards look like. Now, these aren't guesses. We know what these things look like because they frequently appear on inscriptions and in art. Fragments of them survive, so it's, you know, the, the replicas you're seeing there are, are fairly likely to be quite close to uh, what the originals looked like, you know, whether it's the, the legionary eagle in the, the middle here with the, the thunderbolts in its talons, uh, the, the standard, the flag of one of these cavalry regiments, it's the Ala Prima Thracum, you know, the first regiment of Thracians you know, from roughly Bulgaria, European Turkey, uh, the standard of the Legion 14 Gemina, you know, with uh, various discs on it depicting deities or medals that the whole regiment had been given for valor. And I can't quite read the one at the beginning. Was it 15 Apollinaris? The, the people of the, the, the men who'd served in the legion and in the auxiliary regiments or who were attracted to settle round about this base, they came from all over, uh, camp followers, would turn up you know, simply because they had services to sell or things that they wanted to sell the soldiers, and they, they come from all over the empire. And it's quite striking to see what impact that had on the religious taste of the, the people who were, were based there. Deities that were part of the Roman official pantheon, of course, appear regularly on inscriptions, you know, to you know, Jupiter, or Venus, and so on, you know, all the, the, the deities of the official Roman pantheon. But it's quite striking how many provincial deities appear as well. Sometimes provincial deities that had their own name, but the people in that area said, ah, that uh, our god such and such is your god Jupiter, so they would you know, give it a double barrel name. And that's what you get with this very popular deity that we find at Canuntum, and also at many other military posts, it was particularly popular with soldiers, is uh, this deity from the small town of Dolike in southeastern Turkey, down to where modern Gaziantep is, uh, the deity was the supreme god of Dolike, the small town there, uh, but the people there equated it with the Roman deity Jupiter, and it then became extremely popular throughout the Roman Empire as the god Jupiter Dolichenus. That's what we got with these two inscriptions there. This is uh, Jupiter Dolichenus here, shown in both of them. Not just the 5,000 soldiers and the camp followers, but you know, every other year, and it was a biannual thing, veteran soldiers would retire, and in most cases, having served locally for a decade, two decades, 20, perhaps the whole 25 years had been in that base and nearby, they had no incentive to go back to wherever it was they'd come from originally. So you, you know, the, the soldiers who'd been with the Legion 14 in Britain, many of whom would have been Britons by the time it moved, they would have had no incentive to go back to Britain in most cases, and the, the military made no provision for doing that. If you wanted to go back, that was your business. By the time you retired, these soldiers would have been in that base for years, they probably married locally, even though they were not allowed to contract uh, legal marriages, and would have children there. They would simply move out of the fort into the civilian settlement nearby or into the countryside nearby if they were uh, sufficiently well-to-do. Uh, it's thought that at its peak, Canuntum had a, a, a population of about 50,000. I suspect that's one of these numbers that nobody would really... Uh, subscribed to anymore that we're sort of going through a phase we went through a phase of giving some maximum numbers to everything and now it's all minimalist uh, but for what it's worth uh, the settlement is has been guessed at by local uh, archaeologists as having a population of about 50,000. Uh, another one of these Roman settlers there that I put on just as a, a last of the inscriptions that turned up, and uh, not all these inscriptions are as well cut and you know, 
nice to look at, but uh, obviously I've picked out the best ones. Gaius Arontius Lentulus, son of Gaius, died at the age of five. Gaius Arontius Ligus, son of Gaius, you know, so the same father, died at the age of three. And Berena Candida, daughter of Gaius, died at the age of 35 and are buried here. So this man, Gaius Arontius, uh, is, is, yeah, that would probably been his name, uh, Gaius Arontius Ingenuus had erected this tomb for his children and his wife. His, two of his children died at age five and three, his, his two, two of his sons. Uh, his daughter, Berena Candida, lived to 35, but he's you know, setting up an inscription, a tombstone for all three of them now. Okay, moving on to the excavations. Uh, it's the site that's been, you know, the, the ruins, of course, have been well known there for, for, for centuries. They, they've never entirely disappeared. You know, there's, as we'll see in a moment, some of them are very substantial, even without excavation. But there's been excavation there for about a century on and off, still going on today. And uh, one of the features of the present work is that they're doing a lot of restoration and the creation of replicas on the site you know, to make it a, a major tourist site. Uh, there are two major components to the place. Uh, there's where the original, original legionary fortress was up there, and there's an amphitheater, as you can see, not far from it. Here's the Danube there. I've tilted it around so it fits with the next slide. So the legionary fortress, and as we'll see in a moment, a large civilian settlement grew up outside the legionary fortress as well. And then a, a separate town grew up over here, about two and a half kilometers away, and a large town grew up round about that until eventually the two you know, almost met in the middle. Uh, but collectively, between the fortress, the civilian settlement outside it, and this town of Canuntum just nearby, uh, it's a very significant settlement. There's what it looks like in the, the, the map produced by the, the, the Austrian excavators. Uh, legionary fortress there, but this hatched area in both cases is where they've detected the, the whole spread of civilian settlement. So you can see that the civilian settlement town here, the civilian town, almost links up with where uh, the civilian settlement outside the legionary fortress expands. And this is where the original small auxiliary fort was for these provincial soldiers, replaced later by the legionary fortress there. And then it was roads along the Danube and roads running off into the interior. This is what it looks like from the air. And the reason we're able to put this on, uh, I'll show you in a moment, I think. There's the visitor center up at the top there and as you can see a lot of replicas have been built. Uh, I first visited about eight or nine years ago when there were just two or three fairly modest replicas. They've now expanded them considerably on the foundations of the, the ancient structures after they've excavated them. So it's, it's well worth making a visit. It's, you're just, and they've gone to a lot of trouble to try and make these as authentic as possible. Now obviously it all looks far too clean and sanitized. Uh, you know, the place probably smelt pretty badly in Roman times, and things would have been a lot more scruffy than they appear today, but you know, tourists want something a little better. Uh, so it's well worth the visit, nevertheless. And inside the visitor centre, sorry, it's a rather poor photograph here, they put up some artist impressions of what you might have seen as you went along the roads outside. So you'll recognise this tombstone. It's the one for that soldier I mentioned right back at the beginning. There's his chain mail, his helmet, and the, the, the horse. I was suggesting this is what it might have looked like when it originally stood beside the man's grave on one of the roads leading into the, into the town. Uh, and they'd all have been decorated as well. They're, they're, this is not a, a, a modern fantasy. Almost all of these things would have been colored in some way. They'd be much more colorful than we see them today when we're just looking at the, the, the natural stone. Occasionally, you do find traces of color still in the bottoms of some of the letters. And I can't have a feeling this one must be a little bit exaggerated. I mean, I, I would have thought Roman roads would, should have been a bit better than that. But uh, again, it's uh, part of the, one of the roads leading out of the town uh, with tombstones on either side. And inside the visitor center, they've got this sort of marvelous huge screen you know, sort of running through a succession of uh, talks on you know, what this place may have looked like originally. And just outside, a huge model of the town. I couldn't get it all in with the wide angle lens when I can get it all in without climbing on something, which I was a bit reluctant to do. But as you can see, it was, it's in, in the model, you know, it gives you this magnificent impression of just how extensive this place was uh, with all these tile roofed buildings. 
in contrast to what would probably have been there before, which had been much more flimsy structures from the pre-Roman period. And of course, the, the major public buildings, a bath building here, and part of the forum over there. Two amphitheaters, now, as, you, as you know. A theater is half of the circle, where normally it would be cultural activities, plays, pantomimes being put on. An amphitheater we associate with uh, the games, the uh, gladiatorial fights, wild beast fights, uh, much more bloody affair. In practice, in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, where there are lots of theaters and almost no amphitheaters, that wasn't because the, the Greek speakers of the eastern half of the Roman Empire didn't like the blood sports, just because they simply put them on in the theater. You know, it would be Sophocles one day, a pantomime the next day, and half a dozen gladiators hacking each other to, to death the next day. But at Conuntum, we've got something unusual. We've got two amphitheaters. This is the one that's associated with the legionary base, which would probably have been used partly to provide entertainment for the soldiers, but also as a convenient place for mustering all the soldiers and being able to talk to them uh, en masse, you know, 5,000 men at once. And the city amphitheater is there. And Excavation recently produced this. It was visible as a crop mark from the air, but they've now excavated it and decided that it was a, a training place for a gladiatorial school, a ludus. Uh, and they've done a reconstruction of it. So you can climb up and wander around about it. It almost certainly was just a wooden structure originally. Intended as a temporary place for gladiators to train before they went to the, the, the amphitheater just next door and an artist's impression to give you an idea of what this may all have looked like in terms of scale. You know, with, there's the, the temporary place and there, set inside a rather large building, and there's the amphitheater in the background, looking a little bit like that new uh, stadium out beyond the Burrswood. Uh, viewing the site, uh, there's a, a splendid tower, as you can see on the right there, uh, which appears over here to give you a opportunity to look down over the site, but otherwise you can just wander around the streets into the buildings uh, like this one here where on the original foundations, as you can see the original foundations down here, they've erected this replica on top, uh, trying to do as little damage as they could to the, 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 the original structure uh, or what remained of it. But it's good at giving you an impression, albeit a very sanitized one, of what it was like. Uh, but there we are, well worth a, a trip to see it. And they've put up on the walls, since none of the walls themselves actually survived today, they've put up on the walls the kind of graffiti, indeed the exact graffiti that we have from Pompeii and Herculaneum, where they have survived. So if you've been to Pompeii and Herculaneum, you may well have read some of these on the walls there. Uh, they've tried to restore things with how windows looked. Again, much of this is derived from artists' uh, from artistic representations, ancient artistic representations, showing us what windows and shutters and doors actually looked like on buildings. So they're not leaving because of anything I've said, I don't think, but because they're getting close to tea break. Uh, and you can see some of the buildings, the replicas, you know, full scale, up to including the, the, the roofs. Uh, and inside, They've decorated the walls very colorfully, again, on the basis of what we know from ancient art was likely to be found in these, these buildings. Uh, this one's a, a public building with its own public toilet. It's not plumbed in, so it's there just for looking at. And then if you have the energy after you've been around the, the the, the replicas, it's worth going down to the, the old museum down closer to the, the banks of the Danube itself and seeing the, the enormous <coughs> range of artifacts that have been excavated on this site and just how familiar most of them look. You know, they wouldn't have looked too much out of place. Probably now they would, you know, where we've got some very sophisticated tools for every uh, eventuality, but you know, you'd only have to go back 20 or 30 years and you've know, gone into any blacksmith shop and you, you wouldn't have been surprised to find an axe head like this. There's a, a, a mattock, another mattock here, chisels, swords, pincers of all kinds. Uh, a lot of pipes have survived. These are original pipes. Uh, you can see they're flanged at either end so that you can sort of plug them into each other. You, know, you put some wet clay on them, plug the two together, and they'll you know, keep, give you a nice uh, 
solid joint, uh, but they've also made a lot of tiles and uh, both the big flat square tiles and the, the ones that you put over to overlap you know, to stop them, you know, water getting through, and then the finials at the bottom uh, right, that ran right the way along the, the edge of the roof. An astonishing range of cooking pots, and these are the sort of things that we know that the, the military in particular would have had a lot of. Your soldiers were grouped together. There were no canteens within a Roman fortress or an auxiliary regiment in which all the soldiers could go along either in batches or all together. Instead, soldiers messed together in groups of eight, a contubernium. Uh, when they were on the march, they were uh, assigned tents, eight to, eight to a tent. So it's a sort of platoon, I suppose, or a half platoon of soldiers. And they were given grain, unmilled grain. They had to carry the necessary tools with them, a mill to grind the grain. And then they had their pots and pans you know, for actually you know, making their own bread in ovens that would be built into the backs of the, the, the ramparts. Uh, so soldiers had the, their pots and pans, this sort of thing, in large numbers. And large numbers of them survived from the excavations there. Most of these things were probably obtained to turn up in uh, graves, graves that had not been looted in antiquity. On the other side, the other slide there is of how they provided artificial light with hundreds and hundreds, and that's just the ones that survive, of these clay oil lamps. Uh, some of them with multiple spouts, as you can see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spouts on that one. Lots of others of four or five spouts here with uh, uh, a wick and uh, a light at the end. These would be particularly commonly found in around the bath buildings. So the bath buildings tended to be rather dark inside, so you need a lot of artificial lighting. Uh, a lot of glassware has turned up, Roman glass. Uh, production of glass in the Roman period reaches a level that was several times the highest that we'd seen before and was never to be reached again until about the 17th century in Europe. Glass was something that was within just about everybody's uh, ability to purchase. It became a very cheap commodity, churned out in vast quantities, almost industrial scale, uh, or almost modern industrial scale of, uh, of activity in production. Uh, a lot of precious items as well, brooches, rings, bracelets, Huge number surviving, and again, these are the sort of things that would survive in, in graves, and because they're, they're gold, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of going to survive better. Uh, another selection of these rings on the left, earrings probably. I suspect these are earrings. Over here, we've got brooches. Large numbers of brooches as the pin you for holding your tunic at the, at the shoulder or a cloak. And lots of finger rings with, uh, sorry, it's a little bit out of focus. I think it's a big bit out of focus. Uh, lots of finger rings with amber insets, with often a decoration of some deity or other. Honestly, you know, if your favourite deity was Venus or Jupiter, you know, you'd have that on your, your finger ring. So huge numbers of those survived as well. Uh, these ones over here are interesting because you've, oops. Uh, We've got a variety of insects of, I think it's, uh, I forget what it's called, Mil millefiori, is that, is that the, the term I'm thinking of? Uh, it's a sort of powdered glass of different colours that you could use as insects, uh, as a decoration. Uh, the reason we were able to take all those aerial photographs of the place was that having visited the place on the ground some years ago, uh, your s senior RAG committee members, sparing no expense to get you the best illustrations for lectures like this. Uh, Don Boyer and I had the opportunity to go flying from Vienna when we were at the conference there last year, uh, which took us over Conuntum to take lots of nice photographs of the place uh, as we went round. And on the way from Vienna, where we were flying to Conuntum, we didn't turn our noses up at prehistory. There was some of it there with these rings for probably Bronze Age uh, structures and the foundations of a Roman villa that's been excavated and I've never been able to track down where it was. I didn't have a GPS in my camera in this case, so I've never been able to track down exactly where this is. I 
can't understand why people who had such a rich villa would have built it so close to the power cables. I mean, what were they thinking of? <laughs> uh, other structures at uh, Conuntum, when you get there, a, a building that's been called a palace. Uh, it's got certainly this great um, niche at one end of the, the structure, a very large structure as well. As you can see, they're still working on it. This was just about it was about 18 months ago, so I'm not sure how much further they've got. Well, Donna and I will have to go back, you know, apply for one of these RAG scholarships to go back, I think. And the last of the structures is this very strange one called the Heidentor. Uh, it's a triumphal arch thought to be have been set up by the Emperor Constantius II, who was there in person in the 350s. He's the son, one of the sons of the Emperor Constantine the Great, after his brothers had done each other to death. He, he emerges as the sole emperor for our time. Uh, the structure itself just stands in a, in a field. There doesn't seem to be anything else around it. It's the, the rump of a great triumphal arch. And it too is well worth a, a visit. At the ground level, you can see that it's very substantial still, even though it's just part of it. The, the rest of it was there and arching over here. And there's a, one of these transparent boards that you can stand behind that's got an impression of it etched on it. So if you stand in just the right position and look through, you can see the structure behind and what it probably looked like when it was uh, intact. You know, a very substantial four-way arch. Um, there was something the same at Richborough in Kent in Britain, uh, a four-way arch put up probably to commemorate uh, where the Roman invasion armies originally landed back in AD 43. But sort of four-way arches are relatively rare. We, we tend to think of an arch with a, a single opening or sometimes two smaller ones, one on either side. Uh, a four-way arch like this is relatively rare. OK, I'll stop at that so we can have our tea. Then we'll come back and look at something a little closer to, I was going to say a little closer to home, but a little closer to Rome. I give you my glamorous assistant. <laughs>